gentlemen. Tell me about the first film you ever made. Oi, um, probably in the first year of film school, we had that, uh, whatever the fucking exact name it was, but we shot on black and white on a Bolex, silent black and white. It was supposed to be like a dream sequence we were supposed to film. It was supposed mm-hmm. to, and, um, I don't know, I was just like, alright, well, I'm the fucking freaky Tarantino film student kid, so I'm gonna do a crime story, but make it a dream. And it was, you know, having to do it without any dialogue, speak very visually with the story and all that. So I did a dream sequence of a guy losing all of his money betting. He robs somebody to make to get money and then he's attacked. And oh, well, maybe it was a dream, but oh, no, maybe it wasn't. And I don't know. I mean, I remember uh, the teacher, Lisa Robinson, said it was uh, actually pretty well shot. And I don't know for the. uh, you know, it was, it was well shot. There was some pretty good stuff in there. You know, it was whatever. It was nothing special, but, you know, that maybe there was something there. But I don't know. I mean, I didn't do much filming at film school, <laughs> but um, I did that. And uh, I don't know. I mean, do you still have it? Oh, I have no idea. It might be somewhere on a hard drive. If you can find it when we do this, I, I think we should put our first uh, film school films up on the socials. I think we should just let the audience see them. I mean, I'd have to look, but yeah, I mean, it might Dick be somewhere. Because uh, your second film uh, is How We're Friends. Yes. Right? I think it was because I needed, I think, we were sh- I think we were using sound at this point, right? I, yeah. I remember what it was. And uh, I needed, you and I had both rented the same camera. Yeah. So the deal you made me was come to my house, shoot this film with me, and then I will, then you just take the camera from there. And so I, you and I, like, we had talked, but we didn't really know each other. Um, yeah. And so I'm like, fine, whatever. Uh, I follow you to your house, at which point, and I, I should have asked questions, <laughs> but you went, you went, okay, so now here's what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to play the guy who owes me money. All right. So I'm going to tape your wrists together. And he taped my wrists together. And again, I'm like, sure, whatever. And then you come out with a samurai sword. Yeah. And it wasn't until then that I realized, oh, I'm, I might be in danger. I don't know this man. Uh, you know. But uh, as the audience tell, you did not murder me that day. Um, no, not yet. Yeah, you may have wanted to many times in the past, but not that day. Um, so my first film, I mean, you know, there's my first film school film, like Tom was saying, which was a dream uh, that I, I did. Um, with a, a couple of people um, that I'll, we'll post on the socials if people want to see it. But actually my first film and what gave me the bug is when I was a kid, I was in elementary school and we used to have to do book reports, right? And you could be creative with the book reports. And the book I chose to read, not surprisingly, was the uh, junior novelization of Batman Forever. That makes sense. <laughs> and so I had got, you know, I wanted to do something creative. I, wanted, I didn't want to do a regular book report. And so my parents got the idea. My dad especially got the idea. He had had all the toys from Batman Forever. This also uh, tracks. Yeah. And he was like, why don't we make a movie? And like we had had a camcorder that we used for like family vacation. He was like, why don't we make a movie? So we made, we recreated the movie using the action figures. Like it wasn't stop motion per se, but like, we literally had our hands in the frame and we were making the figures go up and down and, oh, Batman, or we're gonna, you know. And we did a, I, I, my favorite thing was we, we did a fake McDonald's commercial too because that was a promo tie-in at the time. And I was fascinated by this. I was riveted by this. Um, that you could do that with the camera. That like, because at the time, I guess, as a kid, you know, you kind of think like, oh, these cameras are for home movies of vacations. And then there's other cameras where you make real movies on. I was like, oh, I could just do that. And I became so obsessed that I think the next year my mom just relented and just gave me the video camera. They just got a new video camera. So I had this big brick. You remember that, like, the camera, the camcorder is that, like, you, yeah. you had to put the full VHS tape into. Yeah. I had that, and I was, like, in my backyard um, shooting everything I could, filming squirrels. I was filming my action figures, doing all this stuff. Um and it's funny because then, uh, so I was doing that and I was trying to like tell stories with my toys. And then when I got to high school, uh, my parents got me a little digital camcorder, like a little, dig- you know, proto, you know, digital camera that you would hook up with a USB, you know, Bush era digital camera. And that was when I started making 
um, films with my my high school friends, my music playing friends, that were just these weird non narrative philosophical diatribes of like, you know, like symbiopsychotaxoplasm stuff. Uh, he's just making like non narrative experimental films. And then, uh, yeah, got to college, tried to do narrative again, and now I'm back to doing the weird non-narrative stuff. So it just never stops. It's an endless cycle. Uh. <laughs> Take a trip back in time with us to see the ordinary childhood of an extraordinary man. We're talking about 1969's The Learning Tree, here on You're Missing Out, with special guest Larry Strong. Our guest today is a filmmaker and a longtime friend of uh, Tom and I's. Uh, LJ Strong uh, joins us today to talk about The Learning Tree. Hey, guys. What's going on, Larry? Uh, life is going on. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly the only way to describe it. <laughs> we, Tom and I have known Larry for, uh, well, a span of time that when I said it before we started recording, everybody felt old. So let's just say we've known Larry for a I while. Think, I, think, I think Kyle was an elementary boy. <laughs> Kyle was a zygote when we met Larry. So, um it's been a long time, yeah. It has been. It has been. It's been great. We we all um had worked back when when Tom and I were still more heavily involved in in like film production, independent films. Uh we worked together a lot. You were uh I mean, I'll say it flat out, you were my mentor after I graduated college. Like you took me under your wing and and you kind of showed me the ropes and we worked on it a lot together and I'm I'm still eternally grateful for it. Um I, I do know. I remember having a conversation about that about you, I think you had told me that you wanted me to be your mentor and I was <laughs> I was like in in I was insanely flattered. Um I I've had people say that to me before. Uh I'm probably the most disappointing mentor you'll ever have. Uh, but no, I, I, you know, I, my whole thing is like, if we went to the same school, film school, obviously years apart, uh, um, they call it LIU post now, but back when I was going, they call it CW post. <clears throat> and, um, there were not, there weren't that many people that came out of LIU post film school that were still doing film. Um, and I remember when I came out of that school, I, there was no one that I could look to as far as a mentor who was working in the film industry. So I was more than happy to have someone come out of that school and to work with and to, um, you know, help in any way I could. Um, hopefully it was an enjoyable experience for you. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we got up to even in, in the short span of time we were working, uh, we got up to we got up to quite a bit, met some fun people. You, know, you introduced me to some some real interesting folks. Uh, I met uh, acclaimed character actor Bill Sadler, thanks to you. Uh, yes. It was one of my favorite celebrity encounter stories of all time. Oh, actually, tell me that. When, when did you meet Bill Sadler? We were doing, um, there was a gallery thing. You had me shooting wow. B-roll for a gallery opening. Right. And it was, yeah. there were two people there. There was the um, fella, I'm forgetting his name now, the guy who played Fredo in The Godfather. Um, God, I'm forgetting his name. John oh. Cazal? No, I'm sorry, not Fredo. Carlo. Carlo. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> I would love if John Cazal was there. <laughs> like, did he you just drop his dead. He came back from the dead, yes. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah. he was there and and Bill Sadler was there and you had kind of told me like look once you're done shooting if you want to talk to somebody you can and so you you introduced me to Bill and I was a big fan of this show that he had done uh called Wonderfalls and at at the time that we did this gallery opening uh Brian Fuller was just the guy that made Wonderfalls and um, Pushing Daisies. I don't think Hannibal had happened yet, or if it had, it had like, been in the first season. Right. So I picked Bill's brain about Wonderfalls. We talked for quite a bit, and he was a great guy. But then at the end, because I'm a little nerd, uh, I think I think Captain America Winter Soldier had come out like two months before, and Bill Sadler had played yeah. the president in Iron Man 3. So I said, you know, sir, there's just one thing. I would be remiss if I didn't ask. As president, how do you feel about Hydra infiltrating S.H.I.E.L.D.? <laughs> and what he does, it was so good. He looks at me and he goes, well, I'm against it. And I'm going to form a commission to look into it. And as soon as he said that, somebody came over and like grabbed his arm and said, uh, Bill, we need you over here. And he goes, absolutely. No more questions. And <laughs> Bill looks at the guy, turns back, looks at me, goes, how presidential was that? <laughs> and he walks off. <laughs> I, you know what, Bill? Uh, we had I had worked with Bill on a uh, on a feature film called Last Day of Summer, and um, 
we we were considering a, a lot of actors to play the part that he had, he had eventually played. But I remember um, someone had mentioned Bill Sadler was interested in, in, in being in the film. We we're like, yeah, Bill Sadler, yeah, he's got it, he's got the part. And I remember the first day on set, he and I, I you you've probably been on those those sets where actors are just awful, just yeah. disasters. Bill Sadler came on set and immediately put everyone at ease. He was so approachable, so friendly, so just a regular human being. Um, and I remember every single crew member just loved him. They fell in love with him. It's it's funny and like we and and Tom, ha, uh, we've all worked together too because I you and I worked on uh, a a pilot together um back in like 2014 2015 and uh if i may if i may uh sell a tom a little bit here um tom and i have met you know a number of people in our in our lives you know notable people and i have never seen you know I, like tom doesn't get starstruck whether it's somebody we have on the show or somebody we've met on a shoot or something tom doesn't get starstruck he's just like we're all people whatever we did this pilot and tiki barber uh was an actor in the pilot uh the, the former football player and that was the one time that like Tom broke professionalism a bit and finally walked up and went, Hey, can I, can I get a picture? I was a big fan of this and that. It was, it was great. It was a great time. Tiki Bar was another one who was just so friendly and so just, you know, just easy to, to work with. Um, uh, I mean, Tom, did, did you, I mean, did you immediately fall in love when you, when you saw Tiki? Oh, I definitely felt something. I mean, <laughs> That was back in the time when it was still okay to be a fan of the Giants. Because, uh, <laughs> quickly, uh, that became not the case. Uh, as 2020 has borne out, uh, don't root for yeah. the Giants. They are the 2020 of teams. <laughs> 2020 well, no, of teams. That's the Jets, hard. actually. But, um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, so that was it was a it was a lot of fun. I mean that that shoot in particular. Yeah. I mean you know, uh, I and and you can tell what respect we have for you because uh, I can tell you, uh, if I ask Tom like, hey, you know, uh, can you I don't know just send me an email or something like that, he may just decide no, I'm not doing this. But you got him to crouch on the floor in a ball, and and just manipulate the bottom corner of a door so that it opened at the right comedic timing. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. You know what? It's this it power was, persuasion, guys. It was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we we got up to a lot of a lot of antics in a in a in a I believe shut down school. Oh no, the school was still open. It was closed for like the holidays or something. It was closed. Or, yeah, I think it was, it was like a holiday or something. But it was also, there was like a weird explosion. Yes, it was lower Manhattan. Was Remember that? Bought, yes, yes. Oh, my God. Yes. It, like half the street, yes. uh, I think it was Second Avenue, had literally blown up that same week. Um, so, yeah, it was like a weird kind of, I don't know. Like I, I've always shot films in like kind of weird situations. But, yeah, the school, I, it may have been shut down for that reason as well. Um, but, yeah, we shot two days in an empty school. Um, yeah, you know, when you, when you work in, you know, film, you, you always get up to some, some, some weirdness, you know, shooting in weird locations at weird hours with, you know, either amazing people or just incredible monsters. I so mean, it's, it's I, I work in collage film now, so I do all my work at a laptop. I don't have to shoot a thing. So, uh, so, you know. so my dad, welcome, welcome <laughs> so to Mike, 2020. Mike works with you the know? biggest monster of all. <laughs> The one in his head. Um, I'm so glad you're here uh, to do this. Um, I think when Tom and I had our old show, I had tried to get you on the podcast a couple of times, um, but you were always busy. And also, you and I are terrible at keeping up with emails. Um, we, yes. I, You and I have been having the same single conversation over the span of six years, I think. We're just responding every three months. Um, we tried I'm to get you in touch with yeah <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite thing is we actually um we had scheduled on our old podcast we had scheduled a good friend of yours uh michael arboway came on to promote his new book yes and that's how we got you on the show because you were just hanging out he started telling some story and then you jumped on mike to go wait a minute wait a minute that's not how that happened you know what i like again over episode. My, michael uh quickly michael went to the same school that we went to same film school um, I, I've known Michael for, and it, wow, I feel insanely old, going on 30 years. Um, my One of my best friends in the world. We've been on, you talk about adventures. Michael and I have been all over, all kinds of adventures. Um, and he, you know, he's been 
uh, a witness to some of these insane things on film sets and traveling. Um, but you know, when I, I he was, t- I forgot what story he was telling, but it was something where I just had to like, I had to interject. Uh, yeah, we got we got so many of those stories. I, I can tell you that some of those stories uh, did not make the episode because Tom and I went, this will ruin these men's careers. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I said, put them in. Put them <laughs> there, in. There are some things I, I don't even think I, I, whatever I told you then, there's probably stuff I could never tell you. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, one involved Dennis Rodman, and that's all I'll say. So. <laughs> yes. And we'll just leave that. The listeners will never know. <laughs> Only we will know. And Kim Kim Jong Un. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I'm so glad that we finally got you for this. Yeah. Um, and I had sent you the list of films, and this was the one you picked. So before we talk about uh, why you picked it, let's talk about why the National Film Registry selected The Learning Tree. They said, This visually beautiful and moving, if somewhat sentimentally melodramatic, story of a black teenager growing up in Kansas in the 1920s was the first feature film by a black director to be financed by a major Hollywood studio. Acclaimed photojournalist Gordon Parks directed, produced, wrote, and composed the score of this adaptation of his 1963 semi-autobiographical novel. Essentially a coming-of-age story, the film focuses on Newt Winger, Kyle Johnson, son of Star Trek co-star Nichelle Nichols. Newt's nemesis is Marcus Savage, Alex Clark, an embittered young man burdened with an absent mother and a negligent, angry father. Newt, by contrast, is supported by his hardworking, understanding mother, Stell Evans, who has kept her son on the square despite the hardships and racism he must face. Parks depicts the ambiguous racial attitudes of blacks and whites in the Kansas town with an ironic complexity rarely found in earlier films about racism. So that's what the registry had to say about The Learning Tree. Now, Larry, what stuck out to you about The Learning Tree? Well, a few things. I had seen The Learning Tree a few times in my life. I, I went to a predominantly uh, African-American uh, school system, and we, every year, had to pick um, a historical African-American figure to do essays on and book reports on. And I remember a girl in my class had picked Gordon Parks. And um, so I, this was probably third, fourth grade. So I've, I've known about Gordon Parks most of my life. And growing up, of course, I've, I've seen The Learning Tree um, a few times. So w- when I looked on the list you sent me, I mean, it immediately, I, everything jumped out at me. But that one is like, OK, I'll pick that one. And one of the other reasons I picked it is because of kind of the times we're living in. Um, I think it, it's something appropriate to have a discussion about um, as far as, uh, you know, racism and, and um, it's particularly American racism, which is a very specific brand of racism. And the another reason uh, Learning Tree stuck out to me actually is my father. Uh, my father grew up in Alabama in the 1940s and 50s. So things that he told me about, is, you know, are similar to things that are depicted in the film. So his experiences are very closely mirror uh, Gordon Parks' uh, ex- Newt, Newt Winger's experience in the film, which is, you know, basically that character represents Gordon Parks. It's semi-autobiographical. Um, so th- that's, you know, that's kind of the gist of why I chose The Learning Tree. Um, I hadn't seen the film in a very long time, and I actually, you know, obviously recently went back and watched it. And watching it with fresh eyes, with 2020 eyes, so to speak, um, you know, you you kind of pick up on things I, I hadn't picked up on before. One of the things I picked up on was the kind of the way it was shot. It had a kind of a, it's weird, kind of a Disney-esque. Uh, oh, oh feel. I think yeah. that was very purposeful. <laughs> yeah, it, it is purposeful. And if you look at, um, I think the guy who shot uh, the film also had shot From Here to Eternity and, and Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, yeah Burnett um, Guffey. He'd done that in A Lonely Place, All the King's Men. Yeah. Yeah. So his style was kind of more of a, of a stark, gritty style. Um, and then if you look at Gordon Park's photography, uh, again, it's very, it's very um, beautifully composed. In the film, this film is very beautifully composed, but it's also something, it's something gritty about it. Um, obviously, the subject matter, but then the, the fact that it's black and white. So, yeah, it kind of really, and that's something that never really dawned on me, having seen the film in years past, is how colorful 
and beautifully shot it is, almost idyllic in the way it uh, is presented. Just to kind of maybe make myself seem like a big old dummy, I mean, I watched this, and I didn't, I, I, I never heard of it before we got the list for this season. So I was like, okay, I want to go in blind. I like going into movies blind, knowing nothing. I'm watching the movie. I know it's Gordon Parks, but I know nothing about it. And it starts off looking like a Disney movie. I'm like, oh, what? Is this like going to be this really like, disney sanitized kind of movie it's got that look but then the tornado scene happens i'm like wait a minute is this gonna be like a fucking black riff on the wizard of oz before the wiz was even a thing because it looks like it shot like the wizard of oz oh that's yeah. definitely then, intentional I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's set in kansas so yeah, yeah. And, and so like i'm watching i'm like what is this movie and then it gets to uh, as Larry said, there are some things you could talk about in regards to 2020. Uh, the scene where the white cop just assassinates a black guy in the river because he ran away from him and he felt like it. I was like, what the fuck is this movie? Right. This movie's fucking hard. Like, so it's it's when he shoots the guy in the back that I realized, okay, there's something very strongly subversive and satirical going on with this movie that Maybe when you're younger, you're not getting, and I don't think many people today would get it because not many people grew up with those old live action Disney movies or whatever, or, right. you know. Yeah, well, but and I, I think exactly the uh, yeah, if, you, I, if, you had seen, if you had seen any of those, say, 1960s or 70s Disney. Oh, this is, he's, he's, he's taken, a t he's, he's straight up attacking not just like Disney or whatever, those kinds of movies in particular, that this feels very much like a personal rebuke to Song of the South. Yeah, no, you're right. Absolutely. There's there's a lot going on. There's a lot to unpack with, with, with this film. Well, um, I mean, and, and for me, like, I know the first time I saw it, because the first time I saw it was a number of years ago when Tom and I were doing the old show, our old podcast. Um, I had, because our old podcast, we would pick movies for each other to watch. And at the time, Tom had never seen Shaft. So I Tom, had... Tom, I am severely disappointed in you. <laughs> listen, listen, there are always wait a minute. You lived your entire life up till now and had not seen Shaft? Well, listen, there is gonna be some holes in, in the genre in my genre background. I like to watch everything. I got ADD. I can't watch the same thing over and over again. And Shaft just fell into a hole. But now that, that since I've watched it, I love it very much and I own all three of them. And uh, to keep uh, the purity going, I haven't seen the recent one because, well, from all I've heard, it is a Hague-worthy war crime. <laughs> um, but so I, when I picked Chef for Tom, I decided, let me go back and let me check out Gordon Parks' other films. So that's when I watched his other work, some of his other work, and I will admit that watching The Learning Tree, especially because I had a job at the time and I was busy, I had The Learning Tree on and was sort of like half watching it. And it's easy to, if you're half watching it, think of it as one of those history class movies where it's like, oh, this is the sanitized approved film that your teacher puts on and the where goes the learning tree. And you're like, kind of kind of zoned out to it. And then, of course, it hits you with the, the reality of it. Yeah. Um, I, every five minutes, there's something that happens where you're like, what the fuck? Now this rich white kid knocked up the black girl and she's got to, like, move away? Like, this is not a Disney oh, you movie. Mean, oh, I'm sorry. You mean you mean Judge Kavanaugh? Ju oh, my God. What yeah. a, we, that's that's a thing that you wouldn't have meant anything prior to 2020. And now we just well, hear hey, the name go. <laughs> well, hey, yeah, but hey, in, in 1969, in telling a story about 1920s, at least they saw a Judge Kavanaugh as a potentially good person. Yeah. Larry, have you and you've watched other um, the uh, some of Gordon Parks' other films as well? Um, I the only the only other film I'd seen of his is is Shaft. Um, and I recently watched a he had done a, a PBS documentary. Um, watched a little bit of that, and then I watched. There's a great HBO documentary uh, about Gordon Parks. I believe it was called Half Past Autumn. Half Past Autumn. Yep, great yeah, documentary. We, yep. We just watched it. We yeah. just watched it, and it's one of those things where, like, I kept messaging Tom. It's one of those stories. It's it's almost the like I I kind of like that Dewey Cox a beautiful ride thing where you're just like, and this too. He's yeah. Malcolm X's daughter's godfather. Like, what the hell? What the Parks? If you what? and again, I you know I grow I've grown up knowing about Gordon Parks and who he was and and what he had done and his importance, um, not just to, you know to in, to African Americans, but in for, for Amer in American history. Yeah. He's probably the, one of the most important figures in 20th century America. 
I mean, the guy changed cinema, and all of that is, like, relegated to the last 15 minutes of the documentary. It's almost like an afterthought. It's like, oh, yeah, and by the way, he, you know, he was the first mainstream black man, uh, first black man to direct the mainstream Hollywood movie. He made Shaft, which kickstarted the black exploitation boom, which changed cinema. But, you know, he, he, that's nothing. He did all of this other stuff. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, cinema means nothing to that this is a, man. That is a footnote in his life, which is Yeah, incredible. no, and, you know, and, and, and I, I believe he was once asked, um, you know, if you could pick one or two things to do, what would you do? Would it be photography, film? And the guy was a music. He was a composer. Yeah. He's oh, self yeah. And he wrote beautiful music. He wrote, he wrote the score for his film. Yeah. Um, and I, he was asked, you know, if you could pick one or two things to do, what would you do? And he, I think he, he picked music and uh, what else did he pick? He picked music uh, and, and something else. I can't recall. But but he said no matter what he did, he did everything. He, he was yeah. like, you know, I've done everything. And he said, the only thing that's left now is to do it better. And I'm like, wow, this man, he, you know, people call him a renaissance man. There, there's not, there are not that many people alive today that can do a lot of things well. He yeah. did so many things, not just well, he did it extraordinarily well. And that's probably why that and his strong sense of personal beliefs where when Hollywood started like fucking with him, like on Lead Belly and stuff, he, where he's right. just like, "All right, well, I don't have to do this directing thing anymore. I did, I did it twice perfectly. You screwed Lead Belly. I'm gonna go back to being a, phot- a world class photographer, poet, right. novelist, composer, and just you know forget about all this and try to tell my son to just not do this. But then he's gonna make Superfly. <laughs> yes." <laughs> Now, now I say this because Larry, because uh, because uh, in addition to being a, a film fan, one of the things we've bonded over is being a big old nerd. And so, do you know what Gordon Parks' last narrative film was that he made after Lead Belly? Oh boy, you know I don't. So um... he did he did a film in 1984, decades before uh, Steve McQueen. He did a movie called Solomon Northrop's Odyssey: Twelve Years a Slave. Oh, with Avery Brooks. With, with fucking Captain Benjamin Sisko. You know, in I the lead. saw that. I, 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 it's weird. I guess I've seen more Gordon Parks work, uh, film work than I, 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 that I recalled. Uh, I actually saw that um, yep. back when I was a teenager. Um, and I remember when 12 Years a Slave came out. And I remember like hearing the story and I was like, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't, they, didn't they make that already? Haven't I seen that? And I remember... Uh, Captain Sisko. Yep. You know, was, that, that was a great film. I, I think I saw it on PBS. Yeah, uh, it was yeah. a TV film. Yeah. When I, when I watched that, when I, when I put it on, I was watching that one, and, and the minute Avery Brooks shows up, I was so excited for this conversation, because I'm like, if he does not know about this film, it's going to delight Larry to no end. I <laughs> that a starship captain. It. You know what? Yes, you, you have not shocked me. You have not surprised me. <laughs> I've seen that one. That was fantastic. Avery Brooks. I just recently um, watched that Deep Space Nine documentary. Um, Avery Brooks. They, if you if you are not a fan of Star Trek or if you don't know who Avery Brooks is, uh, you need you need to watch. Uh, what was that documentary called? Um, oh boy, you're not talking about the one the captains, right? The one that was all the captains. No, 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 no. It's no. The, there's it's, something I, that came out not oh. too recent, like not too long ago i know what he's talking about. i can't think of the name of it uh iris Stephen bear who was the producer of Deep space nine had done it it was called what we left behind okay there we go oh, yeah, um, yeah. you need to watch what we left behind there are so many things about star trek but there are so many things about avery brooks that i i always respected the man and i haven't have a profoundly new respect for him for what he he was the first black captain to be depicted in, in Star Trek in any meaningful way, um, the, the, what he brought to that role, his 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 intent, he he wanted to show the relationship between a father and a son, a black father and his black son, um, in a positive way. It just ah, so so many profound, so many profound things about Star Trek: D Series Nine and Avery Brooks. But we could we could do a whole other podcast on Avery Brooks. And Brooke. he directed one of the best episodes of yes. of Deep Space Nine, which is the uh which is uh, Far Beyond the Stars, the one where he's the the sci fi writer, where he gets yeah. the division of being the sci fi writer and it's just Right. And oh, he faces brilliant. racism. Yep. Yeah. Um and I actually they talk about that in a documentary and at one point he collapses to the floor 
yeah. because he becomes overwhelmed with all the the, the hurt and, uh, of of the racist environment that he's you know, experiencing. And Avery Brooks himself, the actor, collapsed. That was a real scene where the his fellow actors actually became concerned with him. And um, when you see them, if you watch that episode, they gather around him. They have to hold him because Avery Brooks is just just destroyed, yeah, emotionally. And it's um, it's. You think about the people, and this is going to bring us back to them. You think about the people who gathered around Gordon Parks. I mean, you know, whether it's these incredibly talented performers, you know, like in Avery Books or Richard Roundtree, or even, again, as we acknowledge, he is the godfather of one of Malcolm X's daughters because he was sent to follow uh, the Nation of Islam with his camera. Right. I mean, the, there was just this immediate recognition uh by anybody who was at least paying attention there was you, you watched uh half past autumn documentary so many people are just like you immediately knew this man was a genius you yeah. immediately knew he was incredible and that's i mean you know it, it's it's kind of funny because you you would think uh you know it, it's it's kind of fun to go from watching the learning tree and this horribly difficult childhood that he had and then watch a documentary about him where he's going, yeah, so the publisher showed up and said, I know you've never written a book before, but here's 10 grand, write a book. Right. Well, you know? I mean, the thing about The Learning Tree is that you can't watch that film or understand that film without understanding the context uh, of the man who made the film. I mean, Gordon Parks, you need to know who Gordon Parks is in order to know why The Learning Tree is an important film. Um, and I recommend if someone's going to go and watch The Learning Tree, I would recommend actually you watch Half Past Autumn first. Yeah. Um, or, or read his autobiography, which I think is one of one of his autobiographies is called uh, Choice of Weapon or My Choice of Weapons. Yeah, um, uh, that's that the package that has Choice of Weapons is arriving, arriving on my doorstep later tonight. So, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, and that, and that phrase that it's that comes from something that he himself said that the camera was his choice of weapon. Yeah. Um, camera is an, and and it's weird coming back to 2020 and and uh, you know people filming and documenting uh, police brutality. The the camera is the greatest weapon ever invented. It it, it doesn't lie. It it captures it captures the truth. Um, truth can be distorted, of course, but it, it it you know it documents much like Gordon Parks did. He he traveled around and documented the life of impoverished not just. Black folks, but white folks as well. And, and not and, just in America. He, he went around the world doing that shit. He went around the world. He did. He went to Brazil. He went to, you know, he went to France. He, he, the man traveled the world documenting human activity in the 20th century, um, for good or bad. But, but it, it, it does, it's a profound thing to think about, you know, how um, the camera has now become oh so important uh, in capturing um, slices of African American life, um, you know, uh, police brutality, police, um, the, the things that, that, that black folks have to go through, um, in, in their community. Um, and again, you know, uh, not, not all, all police are bad, but the bad ones are destructive, you know, um, and black folks have known that forever. And it, and again, learning tree, the, one of the first things you see in the film is the local cop shooting a black man in the back as he's fleeing because he was playing craps in because the he was playing craps yeah and this is this is all based on true events from Gordon Parks his life Which, and you know you you it's funny that you bring that up because i mean it's clear that this movie doesn't have the most flattering view of the police but it's also a little more uh, layered and complicated than just all cops are bad. Because, right. I mean, the, the scene where um, the, the guy goes to shoot the guy, you know, t uh, what's his name? The father who uh, killed the farmer. He gets he grabs the gun and he's like runs off. He's like he's trying to get the crowd to not just go run off and lynch this guy. He's like he's locked right. away. Let me get him. And right. then he sees he shot. He shoots himself. He's like, God damn, he shot himself. And then when he finds out that um, Newt is going to get hunt is getting hunted down by the son, he he runs off and tries to save him. Right. And then he then as assassinates the kid who's running. But it's like, OK, this guy's kind of a shitty scumbag shoot to kill. Doesn't really look at black people with all that much humanity. But 
sometimes maybe he does the right things well, that because, a cop maybe should do. <laughs> well, because what Parks illustrates, especially in this brilliant ending scene, where the cop, you know, the, the sheriff has always looked, quote unquote, looked charitably on Newt and goes to, you know, shoots the kid who's going after Newt and then, uh, you know, shoots, um, shoots uh, the, the, the troubled, Marcus. Yeah, Marcus, the, the, the troubled kid in town, uh, who he's always had it out for. Yeah. Uh, and then he turns to Newt and he says, you know, I'll give you a ride back to town. And Newt says, I can make it on my own. And he goes, you know, suit yourself. And then he says it with so much venom. He says, boy. And yeah. you realize that what Parks has been doing in this movie is he's not, he's not telling you the cop is a good guy or the cop is a bad guy. He's not even telling you the cop is all that complex. He is showing you a man that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these people are, and a lot of these uh, people in authority who have these racist uh, feelings and these prejudices are, which is they don't consider themselves racist because they look at someone like Newt and go, you're one of the good ones. Right. And when Newt rejects him and rebukes him at the end, in his mind, he goes, he's not one of the good ones anymore. And he's had it out for Marcus because Marcus is not one of the good ones. And like, that's the complexity yeah. there. I mean, that's why there's a direct line and it's, it's an obvious comparison, but it needs to be made. The way that Learning Tree tackles race directly feeds into uh, what Spike Lee later does with Do the Right Thing, which is that both films do not give you anything cookie cutter. They do not give you anything cut and dry. They kind of just go like, yeah, this shit's a powder keg. That's what it is. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, there's so much. And of course, Spike Lee is, a, you know, is a, a, you know I, I adore Spike and he's a, he's a student of cinema who's always drawn for different things. And you can't help but feel like, you know, when you think about the moments in, in Do the Right Thing when Mookie is, is, is trying to calm down, bugging out and be like, why are you making a scene in the pizza shop? I think of that moment where after early on in the film, when the boys are stealing apples from the farm, right? And yeah. the farmer comes out and he starts whipping Marcus and Marcus hits him. And Newt kind of goes, hey, man, he gave us work last winter and Marcus shoots back to hell with last winter. He hit me today. I did that stuck out to me yeah. like you would not believe that that was a profound bit of dialogue. That was a profound moment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it reminded me of something. If, if you want to compare, um, you know, Marcus Savage was the Eric Killmonger. Yes. Of yeah. this film. Yeah. He was a profoundly tragic antagonist and he was a product of his environment he was a product of the rage of of hate he was the product he was reciprocating all that had been given to him um oh. whereas newt, newt was 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 kind of the the the, the polar opposite yeah. newt was more optimistic because of his loving family they balanced out the newt had seen some tragic things he'd seen two people he's seen someone murdered he was forced to go find the person's body he was he was terrified of death throughout the film, completely terrified of it. Um, but he had his mother and his father and his brother uh, and his uncle to help him deal with those feelings. Marcus had an alcoholic father um, and no mother, so he had no he had no way to express himself other than in anger. Um, there's a really uh, uh, great um, uh, uh, column in the uh, the Atlantic by Adam Sewer. And he talks about this thing called the void. It's a kind of a, a metaphorical and a physical state. Uh, the void being, uh, you know, the, the, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, there's speculated to be tens of thousands of dead Africans laying at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And, and that's the void. But the void is also that kind of psychological and cultural space that uh, people of the African diaspora are, are kind of part of. And in, in the article, he talked about uh, Eric Killmonger um, uh, kind of existing in the void. And, and, and at the end of, of Black Panther, uh, you know, when he dies, he kind of goes back into, into the void. Um, and I see Marcus Savage as that character also. He's kind of lost in the void. Um, he's a victim of racism, slavery, of, of, of a broken home, um, and all that energy gets turned into, um, it gets turned into violence. But it, it, in a weird kind of way, Marcus is the least violent character in the film, even though he's the antagonist. And he becomes the ultimate victim 
And it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, there you, it's interesting you bring up Black Panther. You're 100 percent right. There's so much, and and I mean, particularly, it it exists in um in all of cinema and and all facets of of, of filmmaking. Uh, partic- you know, uh, but particularly in in the uh, filmographies of of the notable um, African American filmmakers, uh, you feel like there's always at least one film some self-reflective film, whether it's Spike Lee, John Singleton, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you obviously Ryan Cougar with Black Panther and with this, that there is always this element of duality at play and the duality of not just, uh, not just the, the black experience and not just the, the American experience, but the black male experience in America and the duality that always has this sympathetic character, whether it's Killmonger or Marcus or, or Bugnet or what have you, that is this there, but for the grace of God go I, element you know where it's where our protagonist is forced in this film to come into conflict with this other character but also recognize i'm a few steps away from being that person myself like if if it weren't for these particular things the rage and the heartache and the suffering that i endure because of this broken system and this 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 flawed country and 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 just regular human existence if i did not process it the way that i do i could process it like this and become like this if my parents were not the parents that i have i could wind up this way and that's what makes the conflict between newt and marcus so engrossing in this film because there's moments in the movie that if you were doing this from the objective like you know when we were in film school and they go well here's scenes you don't need there's certainly scenes in this film that somebody could say oh you don't need like the the boxing match it it's it's essential to the heart of the film even if it is not like affecting the plot well here's the thing about the boxing match scene and and this for me it, it's it's kind of a cultural thing i think that scene you know symbolized um the kind of pitting against one another of black people by white people as you said before, Marcus was considered the, the bad Negro. Yeah. Newt was considered the good Negro, the good one. And you had that, 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 that Barker, that, that circus Barker, who had enticed the boys into this kind of boxing match. And Marcus uh, joined in to oppose Newt um, in this kind of brutal beatdown scene. A very, actually, again, very reminiscent of, of what we saw in, in Black Panther. But that and and I and may you know there may be some similarities in the themes as well. But having grown up in an African American community, you always kind of hear about, well, they want us to fight each other. They want us to kill each other. They want us to oppose each other. It makes them more powerful. It gives them power over us. And that scene was was very profound in illustrating that because the crowd was in, almost entirely white men, yeah, uh, getting a thrill out of watching these two black boys beat the hell out of each other um, and, and, and in kind of encouraging Newt to be more brutal yeah. to Marcus. Yep. And to be clear, I, I'm not saying that I think that scene was unnecessary. I'm saying in the overly critical cinema sin sense, to be clear, my thoughts on the scene, if I can read my note verbatim, was God, fuck, the fight in the ring is shot like a slave auction, Jesus haunting, and God damn, the sheriff is cheering on Christ, most upsetting scene in the film, humanity is irredeemable. So. Kind of hit me. That one kind of hit me. <laughs> that was no, you got it. It's 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 probably one of the most important scenes in the film. Yeah. Um. To, and it really illustrates the overall theme. It's, of, it's the whole movie in just that scene. The whole movie. You you tell the whole movie in that scene. It's it's yeah. I mean, going back to, you know, Mike mentioned Spike Lee do the right thing. I mean, it's the love hate speech and do the right thing. This whole movie right. is about the differences between love and hate and how love can make someone like Newt, who's not stupid or naive. He knows what the score is. He knows how brutal the world is, but he's angry about it, but he's not going to run around like a, like a, like a spark plug, like a lit fuse waiting to explode the way Marcus is. And that, that whole scene is basically just, you watch everyone around them disappear until it's just them two. And love is going to overcome hate because hate's going to make you blind. Right. Like Marcus is just blindly swinging haymakers and Newt is like, well, no, I'm going to nail him in the gut a few times, wear him out, and then I'm going to clock him in the face while he's just swinging around wildly, which, I mean, that's 
the end of the movie when he goes out comes at him with the knife he he cuts him but newt overcomes him and could very well kill him and say no i'm not gonna do that i'm not i'm not a killer because it's it's funny because this film does not get the mainstream attention and acclaim that a lot of the other classic films and pretty much every other film in our first year of the registry gets because it is not invoked as often as a Casablanca or a Godfather where you know the scenes even if you haven't seen the movie. Because this film does not get that, because it's not so oversaturated, when you're watching it, you start to see, oh, this is where this director got this from. Like Larry's bringing up the the Black Panther elements. The other thing that comes to mind watching that boxing scene to me is uh, the fight scene in Moonlight. That heart-wrenching moment when Chiron and Kevin are forced to fight each other, which again Mm -hmm. are childhood friends. And again, you have a character that is dealing with this conflict of, I cannot be too aggressively masculine or this group of people is going to write me off as uneducated and uncivilized, but I'm also being forced to defend my manhood and my masculinity by engaging in this fight. It's, you know, it is somebody who is reluctant to fight having to do that. So uh, do you think um, Barry Jenkins is going to bring any of the learning tree with him to Disney Presents the Lion King 2? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I've cashed all my... At this point, because I was, and, and Larry can attest to this, I think, because I was talking about this film back when we were working together be- well before Moonlight, which is I've always been a big fan of Medicine for Melancholy, um, the film he did with Wyatt Cenac. So then after Moonlight and after uh, If Beale Street Can Talk, Barry Jenkins can do whatever the hell he wants, and I'm still and I'm in. He, he's I'm he's, he's, he's going to do all of that while The Lion King 2 is rendering because <laughs> he's not actually making The Lion King 2. He's overseeing a team of people render the movie. Well, if he follows in the footsteps of Jon Favreau, just does a cooking show while the, show, while the movie's actually being made by CGI artists. But that is <laughs> I'll be honest. Point. Wait, can I be clear? I will give all of, the, all of the money in my savings account to get, which is like three bucks, uh, to get a Barry Jenkins, Lulu Wang uh, cooking show. I'll take it. Give me it. Well, I'll just me watch, all the I just want to watch Barry Jenkins just like, I don't know, maybe not do a cooking show, but like he'll do like a YouTube film criticism show while he's just eating a sandwich and just being like, yeah, so <laughs> I saw the new Kraft movie. Eh. <laughs> or like, oh, hey, I finally, I finally got to see Fast and the Furious 10. Boy. I... <laughs> my my favorite thing about this scenario, if I could just go off on this tangent, Tom, is that you're taking, is it is that I'm, I'm imagining the people who would tune in, going, oh, this is one of the best filmmakers today. I wonder what insights he has, and every time it's just him going, yeah, was yeah, fine. He's too busy. He's too busy just... eating his. He's too busy eating his sandwich and counting the money. He's still counting from the massive check he got from the Disney Corporation <laughs> to be a to be a computer generated imagery overseer. <laughs> Good for him. Hey, God listen, him. good good for him. I just like, wow. Does 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 he really just need that much money to fund like season two of the Underground Railroad? <laughs> oh my god. Um, Moonlight yeah, so, two back in action. But so yeah, so there is that all of these you know the entries and so much in there. I want to talk about because my thing is when I saw it the first time. You know how you misremember films, maybe that like you watched a long time ago. Yeah. So when I saw it yeah. the first time, I remembered in my mind that the movie was uh in my head I had it as like, oh, the first half is very idyllic and then it becomes about he witnesses the murder and the courtroom and everything turns bleak and I didn't remember that pretty much from the get-go this film is is complex and and haunting and even before the shooting. Just the fact that you have the the tornado scene, which is very obviously riffing on the Wizard of Oz. I, you know, Parks is very consciously riffing that on the score and the way it's shot. Mm-hmm. And then Newt ends up hiding out with the the um, the, the the local town girl who uh, unwillingly takes his virginity. In yeah, this opening big scene. Yeah, big, and that's you know that's funny. I, I don't know if you read the the novel. Um, I, I did read a little bit of the novel, uh, and the novel is a lot more. It's it's a weird thing um, because, and I'm again, I, this is Parks's kind of semi autobiographical. Yeah. I'm going to say that probably a lot of this is true, but I believe Newt in the novel is like twelve or thirteen years old. Yeah, uh, Newt in uh, the film is about fifteen, sixteen years old, and Big Mabel takes his virginity in a novel as well. 
And it's weird because it, it's a weird thing because one in the novel, if you if you believe that she took Newt's virginity, Newt's Newt's a twelve year old boy yeah. and is a grown woman having sex with a twelve year old boy. And and in a weird way, watching that scene in the film, it's a lot less graphic than it is. And the novel is not very graphic, but you get the get the picture. But the way it's presented in the film is almost like a sexual assault. Yes, oh, 100 percent. Yeah, and, it, and it's. It, it, it's, it seems very unwilling in the film and very confused yeah. by what's happening to him. And if it were reversed gender wise, yeah. uh, it, it would most certainly, without a doubt, be a sexual assault scene. And it's, it is in this film too. And what I love about that is I was thinking about, I was thinking about just two years later, Mel, not Mario, uh, Melvin Van Peebles makes Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song. Right, yes. And that also has the, you know, the young boy loses his virginity to an older woman. But in that, and the way that, in the way that uh, Van Peebles films it, it sort of feeds into stereotypes. That it's this young boy, and he's, he, you know, they, they, they call him Sweet Back because of his, his, his you know, large genitals and his sexual parts. And in this... Parks is so sensitive to the idea that he has the scene happen. And then later, when the friend is like, hey, I heard you lost it. I heard you do this. He has Newt coping with being assaulted. Like, he's upset about what happened. He doesn't want to talk about it. Clearly upset. Clearly he was was sexually assaulted. Yeah. Which is not just bold for, for, for this film, but bold for any movie in that time period to, I, I think, even acknowledge men can experience this feeling. Yeah. And, and particularly that black men could experience that feeling. Yeah. It, uh, it yeah definitely... You're hundred percent right. It, it's, it's, um, it's something I don't think that's ever been depicted in film before. Um, you know, a, a male rape, uh, you know, female yeah. on, on, on male sexual assault. But, but in you, you get the picture from Newt's attitude about it when he's asked about it, that he was not happy about this. This is not something that he asked for or wanted. Um, and, uh, so to go back to what you were saying, Tom, about this film, I mean, literally, one of the first scenes in the film is the main character being raped. Yeah, he goes off. He goes uh, off to the Yellow Brick Road to the Wizard of Oz to get raped. To get yeah. raped. Yeah, it, and, uh, it, it, it's it's and it also is. I mean, kind of part of his growth, and it's reflected later on in that he understands that kind of what happened to his girlfriend is yes. not too dissimilar to a rape because more it, powerful and touching when his girlfriend is raped and he and she reaches out to him he takes her hand and she asks him for forgiveness and he kind of looks at her and he's you know with those eyes it's like there's nothing to forgive he there's a sympathy there yeah, because he knows, he knows what she went through what she went through the privilege of chauncey was used against her she saw the money she saw his power his privilege that he could go into the corner store and eat and drink his whatever with nobody bothering him and she kind of got most likely than not got coaxed into having a baby and you know i mean even after that initial scene he goes to like oh her birthday's coming soon so i'm gonna get her a gift right and he sees the empty house and he realizes what that she's gone and he still just leaves the present there just like he he's not angry with her no he, he, like he knows what's going on and i think i mean again it's the love hate thing that by having love in his life he can understand and take in the pain and like the harshness of the world by right. having a f- by parents that don't blunt or lie to him about the world but they can converse with him specifically the mother that he's able to then take the blows that life's going to give him i mean right. I'm pretty sure this is set, you know, this is set 1920. I'm pretty sure he has been told stories by his parents. I mean, depending on how old they are, maybe they were slaves when the Civil War ended, or at at most their parents were. He definitely heard stories about white folks running around, lynching people, killing people, killing well, people there, they love. There was that story, and I don't know if you remember this, in the courtroom scene, the, the reason Newt didn't want to come forward yeah. with, with what he had known yeah was because his brother had told him about a, a, a town, a couple of towns over, where a black man was accused of killing a white man, and they basically, you know, uh, they pulled a Tulsa. They went they yeah. went there, and they, they killed uh, black folks, and they burned them out of their homes. And Newt was terrified of that happening. So they had that, that was, they were surrounded by that. They imagine I mean, being 
and uh, in, in, in surrounded by people that with the, with just one little spark well, could because, completely destroy your life and your family. Well, well because it, in the beginning, it's almost just like par for the course when the cop shoots the guy who's running, where they're just like, you didn't have to shoot him, man. Where it's just like, yeah, this sucks, but it's kind of just the way things are in their lives, which is yeah. kind of the saddest part of it, is just the blasé acceptance of just, well, cop shot him. If you, if you heard Gordon Parks kind of talk about, um, I think he kind of narrates uh, the beginning uh, uh, of uh, that documentary we're talking about, and he's talking about how beautiful the landscape is yeah. in Kansas. And then he kind of goes into this, I, I believe it's a, it's a poem he's reading, and he goes into this part where he talks about how the beauty that he grew up with and, and, and the, the environment was juxtaposed with this brutality, the violence that he had witnessed, uh, you know, almost since from birth. Which, um, again, is kind of what the, the choice of filmmaking style is representative of. Look at how beautiful this is. Exactly. But then you look at the details and you're like, holy shit, this is fucking dark. What the fuck? Yeah, that's, you know what, I honestly... I thinking, l- looking at it, and having watched the film again, I'm like, this film had to be shot this way because yeah. otherwise, it would be it, it. You couldn't get through it. Well, it's it would and almost also, be uh, too much. Like, I guess not to really lump all this shit in together, but it would kind of be like watching Roots when that TV minute where it was just so clearly like, oh, everything's brutal, everything's like kind of rough. Where this puts a f- patina of like. Disney sanitized, everything's beautiful. So it kind of like slowly sticks the knife but in I, your gut but by I the end that. where you go, like because of the full circle nature of the story where it ends where it began with a young black man getting shot by a cop because he was running and it's just, right. this is life where you go, fuck, yeah, this is beautiful, but God damn, we should maybe burn this all to the ground. But I also <laughs> think, I think the beauty of this film to me and the reason it's shot the way it is, because the other problem it could have, so many movies that are set in the past shoot in sepia tone or they drain the colors to be like old timey pictures. And that just makes it feel distant. The beauty of this film to me is the fact that I don't even know. I mean, I'm intentional. There's definitely the intent on Parks's part to portray the hardships that he experienced, the hardships that people around him experienced, but it never dips into what some people call misery porn. It never dips into that because instead I think what he's trying to do with this film is he is using the language of mainstream Hollywood's coming-of-age films to not even... Because it is a story about a young boy discovering love and discovering sex and discovering morality. And I think that you know, the same as any other coming-of-age movie, he is simply saying to... You know, he's, he's saying to black audiences, look, I'm going to show us what we went through for once. You're going to have that. But also to white audiences go, look, this is... You know, I grew up practically the same as you, except for uh, occasionally um, some of the worst parts of humanity would just swoop in and interrupt it. Like, this is still a story about falling in love, but instead of it being, you know. You know, it's one of the things that I think is why this movie is so important and why it's in the registry is like, this kind of feels like the first coming of age movie. Because, I mean, at the time this movie's made, especially about the time the uh, movie's set in, there was no such like thing as like teenager. Like, I mean, maybe in sixty nine we're starting to get to the idea oh, yeah. of like, okay, yeah. give kids yeah, the I mean, time the to like grow. two years before. But like, this is set in a. But like, you, I, I, I can't really think of too many movies like like when you think of coming of age movies, you think of shit from like the eighties or nineties or maybe the seventies. You think of no, the stand- um, um, yeah, you're, you're you're right. I think I think you're you're spot on. Um, th- this is kind of um an early coming of age movie in the in the sense that we know it because um, anybody who was making yeah. movies in the 60s i mean by the time you allow a guy at that age of gordon parks to make a movie that where uh, you know that gordon parks didn't have live a life of you could be a teenager i mean maybe filmmakers younger than him like a mike nichols could see like okay there's a distinct age difference that we need to accept of when you're like 12 and when you're like 18 or 19 where you need time to grow and let things happen. And I think that's, you know, again, one of the brilliant things and more important things about the movie is that this is kind of the first time a mainstream movie, not just because it's by a black filmmaker, but just by any filmmaker of just, here's life specifically from the point of view of a child, not a Disney movie where it's like, oh, here's a wacky hijinks with a talking car. Here is life as a child 
in a specific time, a specific era, but this specific child is living in a fucking horrible world, and he has to go through it and come out the at the other end of the river where Colonel Kurtz is racism in 1920s America. Well, but I, I, I think there's also an element, too, because, you know, you mentioned there were kind of, there were films that were nostalgically looking back on childhood, like, you know, to mention Disney, like, so dear to my heart, uh, which is just like, oh, being back on the old ranch and stuff like that, you know, uh, Spin and Marty, things like that. I think what's impressive, you know, what, what stands out about this film is the fact that it's kind of like how uh, Friday, I know this is the weird comparison a bit, but like when you watch Friday, Friday is a just a just a goofy buddy comedy, like so many other goofy teen comedies. But then there's a scene where Ice Cube has a gun and his dad is trying to tell him, please don't go down this path. And what that movie's doing with that scene is not just it's not just to have that scene there. It's a way to kind of illustrate like, yeah, this is, this is life. Like it alternates, like it goes into these dark places. And so learning tree, I think is, is in part parks kind of going like, it's not about it's tackling racism as part of a story of this boy growing up rather than saying, this is what this film is about. The film is not about the trial. The film is not about the cop. The film is not about that. It is him just kind of going, look, this is for, for a good portion of this country, this is what life is, and I want to reflect it. And right, because we're, we're, we're you know what though, Tom Tom is Tom is right though. Yeah. Also, in that it is at its heart, it is a coming of age film. Yes. It's not a film about racism. It's not a film about uh uh you know just the black experience. It it when you if you peel back all of the layers, it is it is a coming of age film. It, it's and, a it's about a young man's sexual awakening. It's about him uh, maturing uh, and growing. His this character, you know, he does grow throughout the film. He changes. He goes through this, this incredible arc where he's afraid uh, at the beginning of the film. He's afraid of death. He's afraid of, you know, white people. He's, you know, and he, he experiences anger, all, all the emotions. Um, but at the end of the film, you see him as this kind of young man who's gone through this arc. Um, and that's a classic kind of coming of age trope, you know, um, and, and all, with all, all of the, all the fixings in there, you know, you got the first love, you got uh, the awkward sexual experience, uh, you know, albeit a, a, a sexual assault. You, you standing have up to a bully. standing up to a bully, standing up to authority. Yeah. Um, it's all there. Um, it, 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 so Tom's, you know, you're, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head when you, when, and in its essence, it is a coming of age film. It's just what happens that, that Newt's experience, his coming of age, is wrapped in racism yes. and violence and bigotry. Yeah. Um, so and, that that's just part of his particular experience uh, that we see in the film. I mean, because we're like, what, seven years, I think, after like the 400 Blows, which kind of is the first ever. It's actually a full decade. Full decade? 400 Blows yes. is 59. So. so like this, I mean, American movies weren't doing this, and I don't even think... 400 blows necessarily lit the fuse of like a hundred imitators the way like uh stand by me did in the 80s uh it, i think there's i mean there's a lot of stuff that's why this movie is so important and impactful more than just it was the first movie made in a mainstream studio way by a black man um and just also to go to your point to, to reference two points and pr- bring them together how you talked about this isn't misery porn and if this was like a different filmmaker and it was just like, take the scene out, a misery porn movie wouldn't have the scene where they're in the bar and the fat pimp essentially <laughs> is just is just singing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Tom, you're, you're, you're right. Yeah, you, you're, you're right. This is not, you know, and for people who are you know, thinking, oh, man, I don't want to see another film about black people, you know, getting their asses kicked. That's not this. This no, is not, not at all. this is not 12 Years of Slave. This is not this is not Selma. It's um, like this, fucking this the scene in. Life. It's like the scene in Black Klansman where they just stop the movie to just dance in a club for yeah. three straight minutes through the entire song. I, it's just here's some black happiness. Not everything in their lives is just constant misery and abuse. No, no absolutely not. Uh, there's a lot of films today about the black experience that you know, as you say, it really they really want to p- depict the brutality. Um, and the the horror and the misery of of racism, but you know, going back to to my, my father, my mother, she grew up in in South Carolina in the, in the 1950s. Their you know their lives weren't 
misery. They, you know, they were they had really amazing happy time. My father told me some some of the most amazing stories. He's almost like like our gang, little rascals type adventures him going on. I mean, we're talking about a little black kid in in, in Alabama in, in, in the 1950s. You know, hopping rail cars and fishing down by the the river and, and you know crazy shit like that. The stuff that kids today could could never even do. So no, if if it was all misery, misery, you know, you know, you have a whole generation of people, a couple of generations of people that would, that would just fucking hang themselves. Yeah. Um. And this film, um, was made at a time where the you know a, a black man didn't get a whole lot of chances to make uh films like this. This was his. This was his one shot. And, you know, Gordon Parks really wanted to make this movie accessible, I think. And and he was going off his own memory. And, you know, if you ever listen to Gordon Parks talk about growing up, um, you know, he, he talks about growing up in Kansas in some very flowery language. You know, um, it's it's um, I don't I, I think if it had been all misery, we would Gordon Parks wouldn't be who he was, you know. Um, and I, I would say anybody who wants to go into this film or who wants to see this film, please know that this is, this is a, this is a, an entertaining film to okay. watch. It's very entertaining. It's, it's shot in, in, in a way that's very pleasing. Um, uh, there's that, that scene where the old fat guy is singing, uh, blues music. That's a fun scene. And yeah. it's just, it's just in there just because it has nothing to do with the main character. Has any, Marcus is not in that scene. Um, I'm sorry, Newt is not in that scene. Uh, I believe Marcus is in that scene, but it's just it's just a fun scene, you know. And, and, it, and it exists to capture an atmosphere. Because that's the other thing that Parks is doing here is he's not just telling his own story; he is attempting to show and preserve uh, a part, uh, you know, a portion of human history and a, and a not just a not just a particular uh, personal experience, not a particular demographic experience but a particular historical experience that had never been depicted on film. It's the same way, you know, when you watch something like, um, like uh, Joan Mickman Silver's Hester Street, where she was like, look, I'm going to make a film that can show people not, you know, uh, an inspiring story or a depressing story, but just look, this is what it was like to be Jewish in New York in the late 1800s. And that was the goal of that film. And much the same way, like the beauty of the learning tree is that if you are somebody who, you know, whether that's your lineage or not, like whether your family came from Kansas or not, you can watch that. And, and because of scenes like you're talking about with the man singing, because of the idyllic scenes, because of the way that it shows the fashion of the time and the way that people dressed and the way that because it's in such bright colors and the way the seasons change and the way it shows the restaurant and the, and the stained glass on the windows, it is a, a window into a period of time and a particular place and time and a particular people that because cinema had not covered it before and because it was not the most well documented it could have been lost forever and right. parks is preserving this not you know like a photographer that he was he is preserving a time and a place so that it can be immortalized you know there's something else I, I noticed about this film, and and I again, if anyone's going to go and watch this film, I highly recommend looking at some of Gordon Parks's photography mm -hmm. because you get some, you get a lot of visual clues, you get a lot of uh, elements in this film uh, and from his photography that clue you into some of the setups in the film. Um, there, there's a couple of photographs that uh, Parks shot. There's one called "Off on My Own," which depicts a man kind of walking down a street in Harlem. And then there's another one uh, from his um, crime series where he followed uh, a, a gang member. Um, and he shows the young man kind of walking down the street from the back. And I don't know if you guys have seen either of these two photographs, but the last shot in the film is that, is, yeah. is we see Newt walking down the road from you know the perspective of you know we're behind him and he's walking away from the camera, um, and that seems to be a, a a theme with Gordon Parks with especially men. I don't I don't know if he's ever shot any women um, in that composition, um, but something I think it represents is kind of Gordon Parks himself on this journey um, where we were left you know asking the question where is he going, 
we already know where he's been. The film has shown us where he's been, but where is he going? And a lot of his photographs, uh, well, the, the two photographs that I, I'm referring to, um, when you, I watching, looking at these photographs, you, you ask yourself, well, where have they been? It, it's, it's, I think Gordon Parks, his uh, visual language is informed by his photography, um, even though he didn't shoot this film himself. And he, you know, Burnett Guffey, as you said, uh, shot the film and they worked incredibly close to, to, to get this film done. Um, but it was, it's interesting to go and pick out little visual cues in Gordon Parks' photography and kind of seeing, oh, wow, that shot of, of Newt running across the plane. You know, it's very typical of uh, Gordon Parks, you know, with some of his photography to have these immense spaces around the subject. So, yeah, you know, it, even though, like I said, even though he didn't shoot the film himself, it, the, the whole film was kind of informed by his photography. And what I love, too, and I want to talk about this one little moment that I didn't notice the first time I watched it. His sense of, of composition, you know, and, and images, of course, you know, you go, well, he's a, he's a photographer, so that's where that comes from. And his sense of storytelling, well, he'd written the novel, look at that. But there are some visual storytelling moments that are purely cinematic that he comes up with in this film, or that he executes in this film, that clearly just came from instinct, and a moment that I loved... You know, of course, in the film, uh, Newt has a conflict with his teacher uh, who tells him, you know, who, who tells him, oh, you shouldn't waste time going to college because people of your race don't normally make it in college, you know, is, is of course, not an uncommon thing, particularly in that time. Uh, Malcolm X talks about it in his own autobiography that, that he went through the same thing. But when Newt goes to the principal's office, the character of the principal is a quote unquote well-meaning character because he is upset that the teacher says that. And he says to Newt, you know, oh, I'm going to look into this. But he also yeah, says he's to a white, him, he's a white man. Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. But he says to him, he, you know, he goes into this whole thing where he goes, well, Newt, you know, it's, uh, she's a product of her time. And, you know, my father had certain attitudes and she has some attitudes and they're wrong, but that's just what they are and blah, blah, blah. So he says all this because he's, he, the principal is shocked that the teacher would advise Newt not to go to college. But what's so great in this scene is it's after the dialogue. The scene ends with him saying, Newt, uh, I'm going to speak to her about this, but you show her the utmost respect. And then it is this wide shot of the office with the principal in the foreground and Newt making his way to the door. And it's silent. The principal is fiddling with papers, deliberately not looking at Newt, and Newt is slowly making his way to the door and slowly opening it. And why I love that lingering so much is that you and the audience are sitting there realizing right now in all of this, this principal has the opportunity in this silence and in this slowness to end this conversation with encouragement, to end this conversation and speak to Newt as a person, person to person. Maybe, you know, these things that, that you want to see and that these optimistic films these maybe unrealistic optimistic films have where the teacher is super, you know the principal super inspiring and spins the chair around and goes now let me t figure out what you're good at or xyz but instead he's just that's it the extent of what he has done is to performatively condemn the teacher but he has nothing to offer newt he ends I, by I telling him follow the yeah i was fully expecting in that scene that the teacher would uh, try to turn it around. Yeah. He would try to say something positive and encouraging to Newt. Newt, you should go to college. Newt, you, 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 you can, it's going to be difficult, but you, you can, you can, you can be what you want to be, or you can at least try. He didn't even, he didn't, he didn't do that at all. And what's he, great is by lingering on that shot, you know, he had the opportunity. He had, he had plenty of opportunity. He asked the teacher to leave the yeah. room. He's like, leave. I want to talk to Newt. And in that, he, he, he like exactly what you said, he explained to Newt, hey, she's a product of her, of her time. I don't agree with it. It's wrong. Um, and I'll try to do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> but just it's almost as if, and he, again, he's one of the good characters, one of the, the more uh, benign white people that you see in the film. Um, and he, you know, you, you want him to be a hero. You want him to be a champion. But he kind of leaves Newt saying, you know, almost like, Hey, know your place now. You know, go back, yeah. go back to your place. And it, in a sense, that makes him no different than the teacher who essentially, in her mind, thinks she's doing the right thing by telling him, don't waste your parents' money. They're right. both authority figures 
who ha- are not willing to fight for Newt. They're just trying to get him through the system. And that's yeah. it. He's not a yeah. person. He's just, I mean, the principal is in effect uh, the kind of ineffectual white person who uh, is just the one that goes, oh, you can't say that now. Like, he's not actually fighting against prejudice. He's saying, we can't, you know, when he hears the teacher say that and he responds, you can tell his tone is just this kind of thing like, You're, we can't say that. Like, you can't, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. And there's not really this sense of understanding of denying someone their autonomy or their humanity. It's just kind of this, you know, the principal is the kind of person who uh, feels that the extent of his activism in 2020 would be to make sure that the school knows to capitalize the B in black now. You know, like (laughs) that's the kind of guy he is, which that's what I think is so remarkable about what Parks does with this film is every character is nuanced. Every character could effectively have their own film and their own story that obviously Arcella could be. And there could be an entire film about Arcella's journey and you'd watch it. There could be an entire film about Marcus's journey. You'd watch it. But even um, the, oh my God, I'm forgetting her name again. The other girl, the girl that, that assaults him at the beginning. Oh, Big Mabel. Big Mabel. That I, you feel bad for Big Mabel because you see her and you see the, the, the woman that Parks casts in that role and how she is big and she is kind of awkward in her own body. And you know that for her, sexualizing herself and being sexualized is the only way that she feels valued. Well, uh, well that, that, I mean, it's implied in the film that, that, that she's a prostitute. Yes. Um, uh, uh, so she, her, her way of making a living, yeah. which is why it was so easy for her to have sex with Newt yeah. uh, in that opening scene. That's what she did for a living. That's what she did for money. But it's also um, like you can tell that when she's doing that with Newt, in her mind, she's like, this is a good thing. This is what I'm good for. This is what I'm useful for. No, yeah, I'm going to comfort you with, with what I know. Yeah, because Newt, in that scene, you know, he's, he's injured, he's delirious. So she, that was her way of comforting him uh, in her mind. Um, every, that's the beauty of that bar, is that everybody in that bar has been dehumanized in a way. Like, this is, the, yeah. the, you know, every character that pops up in there is, is a product, and not just... To be clear, not not just the black characters. When the other the white farmer is in there talking about how he got ripped off, like yeah, the yeah, bar yeah. is the the place where where dreams go to die in this. Yeah, film. and that, that bar was very interesting in in in, in you saying that because uh, Silas Newell was was the the farmer character yeah. in that bar. You saw white people and black people kind of just hanging out together and drinking, and you would think, oh man, and and that can't be real. That can't be something that happened in nineteen twenties. Kansas, but it was real for one particular reason. That character you're talking about, Silas, was considered yeah, basically white trash yeah. by everyone in town. He was an alcoholic. Um, and, you know, that, that place, that bar was some place that, that kind of the dregs of society could all kind of come together. The, the outcasts, you know, uh, hanging out there because he, in fact, is friends with a Booker Savage who is Marcus's father, who's his alcoholic father. It's, it's the joke from fucking Django Unchained, where it's like, well, how do we treat Django? He's a free man, so I should treat him like a white man? No, I didn't say that. Uh, what's the peck of wood that does all the odd jobs around town? Jimmy, treat him like Jimmy. Right. Well, yes. I mean, you, just, you, you just got the little peck of wood Silas running around. He's too drunk to even do the job he's being paid to do. So whatever. We look at him as, well, he's not us. He's certainly not them, but he can hang out with them right? because we don't really count him as one of ours because, well, he's just he's just too much trouble. Well, I, well, you know what? It's funny you say that, Tom, because you're right. They they that, that farmer actually uh, treats him like garbage. He doesn't pay him. I mean, he's a drunk, uh, but they, they treat Silas like like garbage. They had, at one point, he's accused of murder. And the town wants to lynch him, like, like they would, you know. Oh, and they're quick to believe it. They're just like, oh, yeah, yeah this, this drunken idiot would 100 percent kill somebody. Right. But but the funny thing is, when, when, when push came to shove, Tom, in the scene where they find out that Silas wasn't, in fact, the killer, and that it was a black man, all of a sudden, now Silas is an important white man. He's important. His whiteness becomes yeah. important to the town. Yeah. Uh, they suddenly remember, oh, okay, well, he is one of us. 
all yeah, of a sudden. He, he's one of us because you can't, I mean, he may be closer to blacks than us, but he's still not black. And we can't just have the blacks doing that to someone right. that's, close, that's that's closer to us than they are. So that we got to, we got to put them in line. There, there's got to be something done about this. Exactly. And I mean, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of uh, Tom knows I've been doing a lot of genealogical research uh, lately in my own family for a, for a documentary I'm working on. And, you know, you, you very quickly discover how transitive the the concept of race is in America because oh, yeah. my great grandfather, you know, my my on my father's side, you know, is Italian. And when I was looking up his documentation, um, he was not considered white because he was <laughs> Italian. They don't like if you look at where they're listing like the race for people or or, or they call it complexion on these forms. And mm-hmm. there's always people like when you see, you know, whether it's the, you know, the the English or the Scottish, whatever, it's just white, 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 and then uh, an Italian, fair skin. <laughs> they just they didn't he wasn't glad and and that you know i mean you look at you know you go back to 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 certain states during the jim crow era described italians as uh as being a, a sort of a racial middle ground that they I didn't heard, exist I in either heard place same thing or similar thing about portuguese people yeah i don't know yep. if you're aware of there are some people who in in the t- early 20th century that would pass for white mm-hmm. and they had maybe a bit of complexion to them. And there's this whole thing of, well, you know, my grandfather's Portuguese, you know, uh, and that would be accepted. Uh, there's, uh, there was some famous case. I don't remember who it was of some famous person who was passing for white and their complexion was always brought up and they would always claim to have this Portuguese father or grandfather or whatever. Um, and that was kind of something that was accepted by white people, uh, back then. Oh, okay. Well, he's, he's, he's got a little, you know, yeah. brown tone to him. So yeah, yeah. Portuguese. Yeah. That, that makes sense. But I, I had never heard that about Italian though. Oh yeah. yeah. I've, 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 you know, I'm a history guy and I, that's always something that always makes me laugh about this country, which is like, you know, uh, Italians can get this way and especially, uh, you know. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a white Christian nation. This is our nation. Like, no, bro, this was never our nation. We were looked at as we were, we were the new blacks when we came over. The, the, the Irish cops treated us like shit. We weren't allowed to apply for a lot of jobs, especially if, and then, you know, especially with the Catholic nation shit, this was never a fucking Catholic nation. That's absolutely insane that anyone believes that. No, the, no, the, one, the one Catholic president we had got fucking assassinated. And, you know, because he he was a damn dirty Irishman who was trying to stop the war in Vietnam and trying to, you know, not invade Cuba, Cuba. Um, <laughs> Tom, 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 save it for the Zapruder film episode. That's coming. It's coming. <gasps> are you, you uh, going to do a Zapruder film episode? Larry, we are going to do every film <laughs> in the registry. And I, I have said this a thousand times on our show. I said it when I was on um, interview with the podcast promoting the show, which is. The first year of the National Film Registry are all narrative feature films. They are all, uh, you know, films that are easy to talk about. But in a couple seasons, I, we get shit like footage of William McKinley's inauguration. I don't know what that's going to be. The Zapruder <laughs> film is in season five. I don't know wow. how we're going to fill an hour and a half with some of these things. And I'm you, so excited. Let me tell you something. The Zapruder film? I, I can tell you right now, you can fill probably three hours talking about the Zapruder yes, film. Yes, no, I'll, you're right. I'll that uh, yes, true. But like Edison's blacksmith scene, it's like eight seconds of men hammering a hammering an anvil. I don't know. We're going to figure it out. OK, do you recall? I don't know if they had done this when you were in, in our film school. Um, did, did you ever take a um, film history class where they talked about the, the origin of film? Uh, uh, you know, Edison's, uh, I believe, uh, The Sneeze. Um, did, did you guys ever do that? I, I've seen all those films because I looked it up, but I actually did not take the freshman year film history course because I uh, essentially like half taught my film class in high school. So they gave me credit for it. We had a whole class discussion on the sneeze, which is a, a handful of frames. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, like a, it's a handful of frames. Um, there is there you get some filmmakers get some film historians on there they'll they can go into some they can go into some deep shit about yeah. that like and that's kind of the fun with this is that to me you know i guess people when we started out you know there were a lot of people who were like oh you get to do star wars isn't that going to be fun and we did star wars and we had uh, patrick cotner on who was a great guest 
and he was wonderful. And I had a really fun time. It's a great episode. Um, people have already heard it by now. Uh, but we brought it up then too, which is it's almost harder to do the movies that are so popular and been talked about so much because you kind of feel like, can I bring anything to this? And I was so much more excited for something like The Learning Tree, where we get a chance to kind of turn around to people and go, yeah, I know you're probably looking at the list and going, what is this? I, I haven't heard of this because, well, uh, film history just sort of passed it by. It's, it's weirdly not, uh, you know, other than the National Film Registry, most people don't include it in the canon, right. which, is, which is insane. That Gordon Parks is known to most uh, mainstream audiences as the Shaft guy, and that's it, you know, is, 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 is terrible. And that's why it's so great, really, that this made the inaugural year. It's easily you know, one of the most important where... American films of the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Gordon Parks, it, it, dude, he wrote it, he directed it, he produced it, he did the music for the film. Uh, and if you don't know who Gordon Parks is as a person, as a photographer, you, you got to get to know him. You got to get to know his work. Um, it makes the film, it makes watching The Learning Tree all that more enjoyable and, and all that more profound. And, yeah. and if you want to know more about The Learning Tree, check all the special features on disc two of the Criterion. I'm sorry, I'm hearing this is not on the Criterion Collection. I'm hearing this is, in fact only available on a disc from Warner Archive that has no features and doesn't even have a real DVD menu? Wow. Fantastic. This is one of my gripes, is we talked about this with uh, King Vidor's The Crowd. Like, how is, not, how is this not available in a real quality home video release? It's insane. You're right. It's, yeah. it's truly... I've, like, I've, I have my DVD of it from Warner Archive, and I put it in, and there's not a, Like, the menu is just Warner Archive play. There, there should be, there should be a criterion. Absolutely. Cut. Of, well, of, well, um, Warner, Warner doesn't uh, tend to do criterion, so we gotta hope they just do a decent Warner Archive uh, Blu-ray at some point, because it's uh, that's just like, not what they do. Like I said, to Tom, it's one of those things that's astounding uh, with some of these movies, especially when you know, in this past year, when uh, there was there was a renewed wave of recognition of the uh, the unfairness of of Hollywood and the movie industry toward uh, black filmmakers, and black creators. And, you know, Netflix is putting up their collection of like, hey, here's all these movies made by black filmmakers. It's insane that like Warner Brothers just had this sitting there in their archive and went, I don't know, should we do? I don't know. We could probably get some PR for putting out a Blu-ray of this or something. It probably wouldn't take us that much. Ah, don't worry. Leave it to I mean, It's wild I mean, to me. They would they would have to take some time to make it a good Blu-ray. I mean, they, True, they probably but... need to restore the film and not just throw the DVD transfer into would. Blu-ray. Yes, that would be would. Uh, yeah. not the greatest case of uh, putting out a Blu-ray because then Fine. that would just give be a, separate but equal Blu-ray. Give, at least give me a, a DVD menu with a an image of the film in it and maybe some special features that you have. There's so there many. It. There's so much. There, there's they could do. It'd be great if they could include. A making of, yeah. You know, I, I believe well, Kyle, Johnson, Kyle Johnson is still alive. Um, how great would it be to get him uh, and sit him down and do an interview for a special a commentary. feature? Yeah, Comment- commentary. Yeah, well, commentary. Just put, just put the just put half past the autumn uh, as a special feature on it. I mean, exactly. hell, Warner Brothers owns HBO. Warner Brothers, Brothers owns HBO. HBO. They own, yeah, they ha- they own half past autumn. That'd be great to put in a collection that, I mean, those, those things would go hand in hand. Or, I mean, if they need to do a commentary track and they can't get Kyle Johnson, Warner brothers, call us, we'll show up all three of us. We'll just get on mic again. We'll, we'll do the commentary. You know, I will will say this when, when the, the people, the, the, the thousands of people, the hundreds of thousands of people who have been craving a quality, um, copy home video release of the learning tree, they've been begging for it. What they've all been saying is I want a commentary that features two suburban white guys giving their thoughts on the loading trees. What they've been craving. That, but that but 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 that's uniquely American. Yes, that's, that's true. That's yeah. The American way. I will can I can I make one other stray observation, which is I I became uh, you know, I was listening to the song when the movie opens, because the song was written for the film. Yes. Uh, you know, by Gordon Parks. Uh, do you know who sings the song? Uh I don't... Would... no. <laughs> um it, Tom, you may not know who this is, but uh, I guarantee every one of us has an aunt who knows who this is. It is sung by O.C. Smith, uh, who you might remember for his song from 68. You know Little Green Apples? God oh, didn't make little green apples and it don't rain in Indian. Do you remember that song? 
I, I do that song that you have just completely gone over my head with. Really? That I feel like everyone, everybody has like a relative who'd love that. Song. It was, it was a, it was, it won the Grammy for song of the year. It was huge. Huh. And Oops, the next year Parks brings him in to sing this song. Uh, and I was thinking about it because, and I think as we're, as we're winding down, I should address this. We always kind of close out our discussions talking about the Oscars, right? Now you would think this is a coming of age movie. The Oscars love that. This is a period piece. The Oscars love that. This has an original song sung by a Grammy-winning artist. At the very least, that's going to get a nomination. So, of course, uh, this film was completely shut out and received absolutely zero nominations. Well, did, they, did they actually love coming-of-age movies in 1969 when 10 no, years I'm, earlier was the first one? <laughs> Tom, I'm, I'm, I was using that as a bit. I was, it, was, it was hyperbole for the, the, the point of this was shut out. Uh, the Best Picture nominees that year yeah. were Anne of the Thousand Days, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Hello mm -hmm. Dolly, Costa Gravis' Z, and the winner, Midnight Cowboy. Uh, that same year, uh, Sidney Pollock's They Shoot Horses, Don't They? gets nine nominations, but not a Best Picture nod. And, just worth noting, only one African American is nominated uh, in an acting category, which is Rupert Cross for The Reavers. He doesn't win, but it's also the first time that an African American was nominated in that category, Learning Tree completely shut out of the Oscars that year. I was gonna say uh, when you said one African American was nominated, we were like, "Oh well, it's Sidney Poitier." Sidney Poitier, yes, exactly. That's what uh, the that's, that's all it, it's fun, and it's funny too, just because um, this movie wasn't nominated, but it's kind of funny that uh, Learning Tree came out the same year as uh, The Wild Bunch because The Wild Bunch was revolutionary for how it shot violence on film, but the two assassinations that begin and end yeah. this movie have Wild Bunch blood squibs i was like holy shit that's some that's that's like a violent that's 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 some sam peckinpah violence this is kind of surprising i mean this film with this film was incredibly well done yeah yeah oh, incredibly well made movie and uh you want to you guys really want to feel old and feel the uh, the grip of time crush your windpipes we are further away from the release of the learning tree than the learning tree was from the story it was telling <laughs> I have I have come to realize, Tom, that this is perhaps my favorite recurring segment of yours. <laughs> Sincerely, that then. Now I will say I watched all the Best Picture nominees from that year because I was kind of thinking like, well, oh, this is an impressive film. Uh, maybe it was just a great year of films. I watched Anne of the Thousand Days. Awful. Learning tree really? shit. There. Learning. Mike, Mike, you know what, Mike? You're not saying much. I think you can go back throughout uh, the Academy Awards history and look at some of the Best Picture nominee nominees and not all of them are good films what? He's, whoa, whoa, he's whoa, learning whoa, whoa, whoa. That. you're telling me he's, out of africa isn't good he's he's <laughs> learning he's learning that by making putting it upon himself to watch all of the movies that were nominated for best picture every year uh a movie every episode about was released because uh he's learning very quickly uh green book wasn't the first time the academy got it wrong <laughs> oh yeah boy. no they mostly get it wrong you know, there are films that are nominated, not you know, let alone winners. There are films that are nominated that you like. You ask yourself, why are you watching? Like, why in God's name was this film yeah. nominated for Best Picture? Why which did that why, happen? Which is why it's funny. The one time they got it right in like the last ten years was when they fucked it up and accidentally said La La Land, and then had to go, "Whoops, sorry, we meant Moonlight." <laughs> we do get lucky because we do kind of cover on this show. We covered the. Um, the one, the one miracle year, which is 1939, when you know whether you like them or not, like most of those films ended up changing cinema in some way or another. Mr. Smith goes to Washington was 75 is, 75 is a miracle. Yeah. 75 is the one that's it's, it's um, one floor of the cuckoo's nest jaws dog day afternoon, Nashville and Barry Lyndon. So you're like, okay, great. Cool. That's uh, they, all it, of this. Literally works. can't get it wrong with that pick. pick yeah. I mean, you had some, some iconic films that year uh, happening, happen to be released that year. It, it's rare that, you know, you get that many outstanding films released in one year. Um, then, then you're going to have a treasure trove of nominees, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I even look at this year and there's something about the fact that, you know, because I always try and play this game in my head of, uh, you know, well, what would I have picked? And look, you look at 69 in particular, that's a big year for cinema. And I give them credit for the fact that, remember, the previous year, uh oliver wins the only g-rated best picture winner uh and then this year it goes to an x-rated movie it goes to midnight cowboy uh which is a very out there movie 
you have Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids pretty out there. The fact that Costa Gavras is Z, it's so hard for a foreign language film to get nominated, especially then, that Z gets a nomination is great. And then to me, uh, you swap out Anne of a Thousand Days with, with Learning Tree, and you swap out Hello, Dolly with either The Wild Bunch or Easy Rider, and boom, you've got a, you, you know, it's perfect. You're all square. So <laughs> this is our pitch. Put us in charge of the Academy. Yes, just give us the Academy. You guys aren't Please. using it this year. Just give it to us. No I more voting to... block. Just let us make the choices. You guys do, a, do an amazing job. I just think yeah, it, would, it, would, it would go pretty, you know, like we t- <laughs> it's how clear this movie is like um, based on his life sort of movie and just, you know, you get the feeling the entire time. So I thought it was a nice little touch um, in the sort of montage of time going by and him starting to date um, Arcella and one of his dates, he takes her to a movie theater. Yeah. The early days of cinema, which is just kind of like, oh, well, we know what this is going to spark in this young man because uh, look at who's directing this movie. <laughs> I, I, you know what? It's funny. I, I, in that scene, were they watching a Fatty Arbuckle movie or yes. a Buster Keaton I think, movie? I think Fatty. I think. Yeah, that was Fatty Arbuckle, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I remember watching the, the, the montage and I'm like, it, that kind of scene went by so fast. But uh, yeah, that's funny how they're sitting there watching uh, some old ass Fatty Arbuckle movie. <laughs> Probably a case of uh, Gordon Parks being uh... like, hey, Warner Brothers, what uh, it's like silent movies from 1920 do you have that isn't expensive or whatever? And they're just like, Very I don't know, F- Ar- Fatty Arbuckle. Nobody talks about him anymore. His life was ruined. Yeah, we don't have a, I don't think we have a fatty for a while, thankfully, in the, in the registry. So eh, I haven't had a fatty in a long time. <laughs> God damn it. Different fatty. God damn it. Oh, um, oh, okay. Larry, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate this. Guys, thank you so much. It, it was uh, my pleasure being here talking about film. We all love film and uh, really appreciate any opportunity to open my mouth about it. So guys, to wrap up like we usually do, uh, what films would you include in the registry? A uh, quick reminder that it must be an American film and be at least 10 years old. Uh, so w- with this one for me, I latched on to, um, as I'm sure you heard in the episode and figured out, I latched on to the coming of age aspect and, um, how this is kind of the first one, uh, you can't really, uh, put up the 400 blows because, uh, it's not American. Uh, so you got to look at the things it had influenced and there's two I have in mind. And I think both are great examples of movies that were influenced by Learning Tree. And I'm going to have to go with Crooklyn by Spike Lee because I think it is very much... Like we we, we talked in the episode, Do the Right Thing, even Black Klansman has a lot of elements of Gordon Park's work, what we did in The Learning Tree in particular. I think Crooklyn is very much Spike Lee doing his version of The Learning Tree in that it is uh, set in a very specific time, a very specific area, an area that didn't get much play in cinema, which is uh, 1960s, 1970s uh, New York, uh, Brooklyn in particular, obviously, haha, <laughs> Crooklyn, um, and showing just the lives of the children. The parents are there, but it's really focused on the children, mainly the daughter, and just seeing her have to navigate through life, the way things are, how she's kind of in this broken home it's not you know it's not exactly the family she uh newt comes from uh the way things are in brooklyn there's a brief sojourn where she has to go to live with family in the country because money's tight with her parents so they have to kind of unload some of the kids on relatives and we see how things are different for a young black girl in the country it's not as brutal or hardcore as a learning tree can get there's no assassinations there's no cop killings there's no lynchings or anything like that it's not as didactic in its themes as learning tree is and as spike lee can be but i think the way it in puts us into this world shows us what it's like as a child in this world it never speaks down to the children it never speaks down to the audience it's very uh, funny, it's very emotional, and then uh, I think in the biggest uh, connection to the learning tree is that the mother dies, and it leaves a big gaping hole in this family, and you see how the family's going to have to change after that. I think uh, a lot of Spike Lee should be in the National Film Registry. There's some that absolutely should not, uh, that should be burned with um, holy water and uh, thrown into the sea, but 
I think he has a lot of movies that should be in there. And I think this is one of them. I think if you did a double feature of The Learning Tree in Crooklyn, I'm pretty sure you would see a lot of uh, history being repeated and a lot of uh, lessons Spike learned being passed from uh, 1969 to uh, mid-90s New York City. So uh, I'm putting up Crooklyn. And uh, it was kind of a toss up until we started recording. Which is funny because I had you go first because Crooklyn was one of mine. I'm like, there's a good chance Tom's going to pick it. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was considering, of course, I thought Crooklyn, but I was also thinking about the fact, as I mentioned, when we were talking to Larry. The most amazing thing about the learning tree is the fact that every character is so rich that they could have their own film and that their own story could be told. Um, I was thinking particularly about Arcella. And how, if I told you the entire film was going to be from her point of view, moving to this new town, finding a boyfriend, getting assaulted, getting pregnant, having to flee, that's in and of itself a compelling film, equally compelling. And so I was thinking from that angle, and originally I was trying to think from the, you know, the, the, the female filmmaker perspective, and I, I thought about a film that I'm eventually going to try and make a case for in the registry, which is um, Gina Prince by the Woods' uh, Love and Basketball. But then I thought about another film that, that, draws from that learning true well but goes in the opposite direction and talks about the female experience um which is tragically truly tragically we talk about you know the learning tree is gordon parks's debut film right his debut feature film uh the film i'm picking is the debut feature film of this director and as of now the only feature film by this director um, which is uh, the filmmaker is Leslie Harris, and the film is Just Another Girl on the IRT. 1992 drama written, produced, and directed by Leslie Harris. Um, the film follows the story of Chantel Mitchell, who is a high school junior living in Brooklyn, who is passionate about her education and wants to get out of the, the neighborhood she's living in. Uh, she is desperate to not become, as the title suggests, just another girl on the IRT, one of these girls who gets pregnant and drops out of school and all this. She wants to become a doctor, but she also, her own attitude and ego get in the way. Um, and she too deals with a, a, you know, an unexpected pregnancy in this film, and it's, it's uh, harrowing. Um, it's a truly, the, the, the sequence of the birth scene and what to do with the child is, is just uh, truly heart-wrenching. Um, it's a remarkable film. And what's so exasperating, we always talk about films that are, that are unavailable. Um, this remarkable work by, you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough for female filmmakers, particularly black female filmmakers. Um, you know, the, the industry has never given them a shot. Um, you know, very rarely does this happen. Just Another Girl on the IRT is, is remarkable, but it's, it's so hard to come by. It's so unceremoniously dumped that uh, when I saw a rep screening of it, the theater was having such a hard time getting a copy of the film, like the actual print of the film, that Leslie Harris had to supply them her own personal copy of the film. This is a, a remarkable slice of life film uh, about a, a, you know, a period of time in American history uh, that I think absolutely has to be preserved. And this captures it so well and from a very honest and sincere place. Uh, and I think that we should be doing a hell of a lot more to preserve it, particularly uh, enshrining it in the National Film Registry. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, that definitely uh, sounds like something that should be in there. It definitely ties in pretty well with what we, uh, what we got here this week. Yeah, you should, I, I, if you can find it, Tom, which I think you can rent it. Like, if you want to watch it digitally, you can rent it on, like, Amazon Prime. But, you know, home video is a nightmare. But I, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's a, it's a wild film, draws a lot from, uh, it, she talks, breaks the fourth wall, very she's got to have it. It's a really engaging film. Definitely recommend it. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Larry Strong for joining us. You can follow him on Twitter at the LJ Strong. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone who you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.